And then David? I just wanted to report that um, I, had, I attended the Maine Municipal Association uh, annual convention in Augusta last week on Wednesday and Thursday, and there were uh, a number, a large number actually, of quite interesting sessions. It was a really good convention, and um, I uh, brought back a bunch of information, which since I was out of town over the weekend, I don't have for you, but I will be forwarding copies of a bunch of it to you. Um, and I, I just ran into a number of people, including our um, financial advisor, Joe Quatera, and uh, our town engineers, and a bunch of other people who were up there, and they all had high praise indeed for the town staff, and so I wanted to pass that along and say it was very informative. I don't think any other counselors were there, but I would encourage any of you who are interested in the future to attend, even if you can only go for a day, because it is very informative, and it's also um, an enriching experience to be able to be with municipal officials from all over the state because as much as we have uh, uh, a lot of things not in common, we have more things that we, we hold in common that, that bring us together and it's, it's just really an interesting and fun experience. Thank you, Anne. David? Uh, just two items. Uh, Penny Jordan and I have uh, been participating on the recently constituted Municipal Operations Review Committee we have so far held two meetings. Uh, we have uh, at least two or three more scheduled prior to the end of the year. And uh, it's a very uh, interesting, uh, diverse group of citizens and with a lot of different points of view. And I'm looking forward to uh, continuing our work on that committee. Also, um, uh, uh, Anne Swift-Kayata, David Backer, and former Councilor Jean uh, Ginn Marvin and I had the pleasure of judging the pie contest at the Land Trust Fall Fest. And uh, we actually reached consensus, consensus very quickly in all of the uh, categories except for the uh, cream pie category where the men in the group opted for the pecan pie and the uh, ladies opted for this chocolate cream pie. And so we had, to call, we had a deadlock, so we had to call upon um, Anna Brogan, uh, the student member of our panel, to break the tie. And she sided with the women. So uh, anyway, uh, but that was a lot of fun and a great event. And hopefully next year the weather... Uh, gods will be more cooperative mm. with the Fall Fest. <laughs> I would have done pecan. <laughs> Should have been there. <laughs> uh, I happened to be in Scotland at the time of the uh, pie tasting contest, but like Pavlov's dog, my mouth watered, I think, at about the time that the contest was going <laughs> on. So, uh, It's always a fun event. Uh, other reports and correspondence. Uh, I would just call the public's attention, uh, tomorrow afternoon, renowned uh, horticulturalist Rick Churchill will be leading a walk down at Fort Williams Park uh, to discuss the arboriculture there, and also present will be proponents and advocates of the arboretum that is planned for the fort, so it, it would be a great opportunity uh, for people to learn more about the, the, the plant and, and tree growth at Fort Williams and how it's being imperiled by invasive species. That will occur at 2 o'clock, and it will begin at the picnic shelter at the fort. Other reports and correspondence? Seeing none, uh, we offer our first opportunity for citizens uh, to discuss items that do not appear on tonight's agenda. If you would like to speak to an item that's not on the, tonight's agenda, you may approach the, uh, the lectern. Seeing none, we will move on to the town manager's report. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. I, I just want to thank you for the comment you made about Barbara Adams. She was a, truly a wonderful person. And sometimes you, you, you hear names and you don't associate the person with the name. And for those that might not know Barbara, when folks voted absentee here in the council chamber, she, along with Jane Harley, uh, were, were the two women who were usually here, and Carol Ann Jordan uh, as well sometimes. But uh, mostly over the last few years, it was, it's been Jane Harley and, and Barbara Adams. So she really... Uh, you know, as a good friend to, to Deborah and myself and, uh, you know, to a lot of people in town. So, uh, you, you know, you really appreciate what you said, and uh, I know everyone's thoughts go out to Henry. Uh, on a more positive note, I uh, want to thank the Friends of the Library. They had the book and bake sale uh, last weekend. And uh, with all the folks that went to that and uh, helped support it at over $12,000, uh, was raised from 
a lot of people baking goods and a, a lot of folks that have donated books over the past year. So that those money, stay, they don't come directly to the town, they stay with the Friends of the Library, but the Friends of the Library have been uh, very, uh, very supportive of the town in so many different ways. Uh, the police department's sponsoring a prescription drop-off uh, this uh, uh, weekend, Saturday, from 10 to 2 at the Town Center Fire Station. If any, what that's all about, if anyone has prescriptions at home that uh, they're no longer using, it's the best and safest way to dispose of them is through one of these prescription drop-offs. So uh, we expect a good crowd for that uh, this Saturday between 10 and 2. Uh, also wanted to mention that, uh, th you know, there's a lot of talk about all the cruise ships lately and about all the buses at Fort Williams, and some of you have gotten a few emails about that. And, you know, it, it is a burden on the community to have all those buses uh, during this time of year, but it's, it's not without its rewards. Uh, for, for instance, on Monday, which was Columbus Day, we had 27 buses came into Fort Williams Park. 20 were connected to cruise ships, 20 of the 27. And a lot of them stopped by the gift shop at the uh, museum in Portland Headlight, the, the two-car garage and they managed to leave $10,600 in the gift shop in one day. Uh, in the first days of, the first 12 days of October, uh, I don't have the exact count on the buses with me tonight, but I do know the sales averaged $6,000 per day in the gift shop, and that followed the month of September, which was a record month in the gift shop where the sales were $4,000 per day. So, you know, I mentioned this, there's a lot of, you know, what are you getting out of all these, all these buses? Uh, they're leaving a lot of money, fortunately they are leaving a lot of money uh, with that benefits our maintenance and support of Portland Headlight, and a lot of that money in the last recent, in recent years has also, you know, for example, paid for the new entrance to the park, some of the paths and some of the other work that's gone on there, the new, uh, the, the new uh, interpretive signage area that's across from the flagpole. Uh, on the hill in Kitty's, what's known as Kitty's Point after Kitty Davis. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that, and I really want to thank all the volunteers. I know, uh, you know, most of us weren't able to go to the, the volunteer recognition event they had a couple weeks ago, and, you know, it, it just happens that way with some schedules, but uh, really do appreciate, because, you know, we have a couple of paid staff folks down there, but it's mostly the day-to-day. -day. It's the, the gift shops operated by volunteers. So, uh, you know, that's certainly good news, and... Uh, uh, the museum shop has, has been doing extremely well, uh, you know, to 10,600, I don't know how they can do that in that little shop, but uh, they managed to do it. So just want to recognize them and thank them. Thank, thank you, Mike. Do you want to have Deb speak for a minute on absentee voting? Certainly. Deb, would you speak on absentee voting, please? Sure, be happy to. Uh, we are in a full swing of absentee voting. Uh, we do have a November 3rd election. There is a municipal and a state ballot. Um, we have noted that a lot of people coming in a little bit early to vote don't realize that there is a municipal ballot. So I would encourage folks to do their homework. Again, on both the municipal and the state side, we will be here with absentee balloting regular office hours at the town hall, Monday, 7.30 to 5, Tuesday through Friday, 7.30 till 4. And there is plenty of information on the website in regards to how to um, obtain an absentee ballot um, if they want to take a look and we'd be happy to send a ballot. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Next on the uh, agenda is the review of the minutes of the meeting held September 14, 2009. Uh, Dave? Move for the approval of the minutes is dropped. Okay. Moved and seconded to approve the uh, minutes. Discussion on the motion. Penny. Um, I have a general question. I've received a couple of um, uh, questions from people regarding the um, shoreland zoning. And what I want to do just to be able to do publicly is confirm for people what exactly was approved. And um, basically the question that arises is, did it include revisions as they relate to Old Colony Lane and um, Great Pond, or did they not? And so if I could get clarification on were those revisions to the map included? Uh, David, would you like to comment to that? 
Uh, certainly, and I uh, apologize to the extent that I was the source of any confusion, but certainly the, the only maps that we were really focusing on and discussing the entire evening were the revised maps that did include those revisions uh, that have uh, created some of the questions. So certainly my intent when I uh, made the motion and then when I, I think uh, Councillor Backer asked for some clarification uh, when he ma made a reference to the maps, my intention was that we were talking about approving the maps as revised that dealt with the old colony changes and the Great Pond changes. So that was certainly my intention when I made the motion, and that's what I believed we were voting on to approve. Okay. Ann? And if I could just add, um, I confirmed this afternoon that the um, maps that were advertised and published in the Portland Press Herald on August 17th in August before the meeting was held included the what we were calling the modified old colony lane uh, map the one that had the heavy black line drawn back which was the one that we had been discussing and that I it was my understanding that we were voting on but I confirmed that that was the map that was published in the newspaper as part of the public notice process Okay, they were as part of the public notice process. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. Because that was the next question, were those made public? And then the question after that is, uh, basically the planning board sent us two scenarios. Is that true? That was my understanding. They, they had that as an option. That was an option. Drawing. We could have approved it or not approved it, and if we hadn't approved those maps, it would have reverted back to not having the heavy black line. But our discussion was on the, the map that had been revised with the, the line drawn back. Right, yeah. right. But the planning board had voted on yeah. those maps. They had approved both. Approved. Or, or recommended I mean, both. for consideration. Let me, let me try to be clear on that. The, the planning board had, re, had actually approved an earlier map. They heard many comments from citizens during the public hearing that they would have preferred a map much similar to the one that the council eventually got. Uh, subsequent to the planning board meeting about four days later, uh, we heard from uh, the main department of uh, the DEP that oversees these, the, the shoreland zoning, from the person in charge, that they would not object to what the planning board had in fact wanted. So it, it was explained to the council back at the August 8th meeting, whatever the second Monday of August was, that that conversation had happened with the DEP, that the planning board's public comments were both the members of the public who were there as well as the board itself were in keeping with what the, the, the revised map showed and the council was presented that revised map uh, at that evening in August, the second Monday of August. It was fully explained. It was ultimately what you set for public hearing. It was what was advertised in the newspaper and I believe it was what everyone's understanding is who was here at the, the, on the council of what you were voting on that evening. But it, uh, it, the, the planning board had in fact recommended the other map, but they had made clear at the time it wasn't really the one they felt comfortable recommending, but they thought <coughs> their hands were tied uh, by the state. So in essence, the appropriate procedures were followed that the planning board had uh, approved or recommended what the council voted on. The, no, the, the planning board always recommends to the council. Yeah. The council is under no obligation mm. to approve what the planning board proposes, proposes at any time. Okay. So yeah. we, yes, because otherwise the council could never modify anything okay. in a meeting. Okay. Uh, we would be restricted to just what anybody recommended to us. And if the council, after discussion and after hearing, what the public has to say about stuff, we wouldn't be able to change stuff. So okay. if, if we were always wedded to whatever the first version was of anything. So. Okay. And, and certainly my rationale in approving that revised map was it was a fairly uh, small change in the grand scheme of the overall amend, uh, zoning amendments, shoreland zoning amendments, but also was less restrictive in my view than the earlier version. So I was comfortable moving forward with the revised map. And again, I, you know, I, I, hope, I wish I had been more clear, but I, I, I thought I was at the time. Okay. 
and just one more wrinkle. The one that we voted on, the revised one, was very close to what the state, we were essentially trying to come into alignment with what the state recommended, is that correct? That's correct. So essentially what we were doing is taking the revised recommendations and requirements from the state, adopting them to our town, which we had to do, we didn't have an option on that, and then setting them forth for approval. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Further discussion on the motion to approve the minutes of September 14th, Paul? Yeah, I, I just have one um, item. It was a typo <laughs> in uh, the first paragraph, in the uh, first line, um, reporting that I recently rode around town. It, it's just a typo on, on road. It should be R-O-B-E. But it's an appropriate typo for Bob Mallon. That's true. <laughs> That's probably why it's there. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Further discussion. Are you going to be in the spelling bee? No, but <laughs> my, my English professor points. <laughs> I think we should be in the spelling bee. But I appreciate it. <laughs> Further discussion on the motion. Seeing none. All in favor? Uh, please signify. Show it to be unanimous, please. Thank you. Uh, our first item on the agenda is the application for a liquor license renewal by the Paputa Club. It's customary for us to offer. Uh, time for citizens to make public comment. Uh, this is not a public hearing, but we do offer the opportunity for public comment uh, on the uh, renewal of liquor licenses. Are there citizens who would like to speak to this tonight? Uh, seeing none, uh, we will move on to item number 137-2009, and that is the liquor license renewal for Perputa Club. The material is in our packets. Uh, they have applied for renewal of their licenses. Uh, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the license renewal for Paputa Club. Second. Uh, discussion on the motion? Um, I just wanted to make the council aware that I am a member of the Paputa Club, but I don't feel the need to recuse myself, but I wanted to, in the interest of full disclosure, remind everybody of that. Uh, ditto. And ditto here. Any, uh, <laughs> any further discussion on the motion? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we now uh, have, will have our public hearing on the revised general assistance appendices. Uh, I guess before I run down the rules for public hearings, I would ask if there are citizens in the audience who would like to speak uh, to this item. Um, seeing none, I won't go down through the rules, uh, but we, I will open the public hearing uh, on the revised general assistance appendices. Seeing no citizens coming forward, I uh, will declare the public hearing closed. And we will move on to item number 138-2009, general assistance appendices. Uh, each year, the general assistance appendices are updated by the Maine Municipal Association and it's customary and traditional for Cape Elizabeth to adopt the model provisions as put forward by the Maine Municipal Association. Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. Moved to adopt. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of uh, approving the general assistance appendices as presented? 7-0. Thank you. Item number 139-2009, uh, Zoning Ordinance Amendments for the Town Center Zone. Um, the Planning Board is, recommended, is recommending some amendments to the Zoning Ordinance uh, relating to the density of buildings in the Town Center Zone. Uh, it's recommended that the proposal be referred to the Ordinance Committee. Uh, do I hear a motion? David? I uh, move that we refer this to the Ordinance Committee. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? 7-0, thanks. Uh, item number 140-2009, traffic ordinance. Um, Sarah, would you like to set this up? The ordinance committee uh, was involved in consideration of traffic ordinance. Um, yeah, yes. Essentially, um, we went with Chief Williams to discuss the, 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 the sort of I think the biggest issue and the problem was um, 
on, on Surf Road and Cottage Lane pertaining to the beach there, that people were parking all over the place and blocking traffic and blocking access to emergency vehicles, um, and that the residents were having issues with it. So we went over um, some details of that, of where he recommended people should be allowed to park and not allowed to park on which side of the road. Essentially, he wants to do some signage and to um, restrict the parking a little bit, but not too much. Um, and the issue, the, with this other issue was 551 and 553 Shore Road, and we decided to wait on that a little bit until the um, 553 had put in the changes that the planning board is recommending, and or that the, the permitting and so forth before they take a look at the parking there. Um, Mike, do you, is that enough to take? That's fine. And so um, I assume the next time it comes around to us, we'll look at it in more detail. Okay, we have a uh, recommendation before us uh, that this item be sent to a public hearing. Um, would somebody like to put that in the form of motion? David? I move that the proposed traffic ordinance changes be scheduled for public hearing on Monday, November 9, 2009 at 7.30 p.m. I second the motion. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. I, Seeing, uh, I would just make the public aware for people that um, aren't aware. There were a few other small changes uh, other than the surf road area and the 553 and 551 shore road area. And so that anybody who's interested can see these changes online. Just a minute. They're online if you go to council packets and then press tonight's date. Uh, October 14th, uh, all, all of the background material. Thank you. That's a good point. And uh, most all of these uh, item, these agenda items that come before us, uh, the background information uh, can be found online, or if you can drop by town hall and, and they'll be available in hard copy for people who, who don't have access to computer. So uh, further, David? Not, not further discussion, but Mike, uh, will Chief Williams be here? to sort of set it up at the public yeah. hearing with his yeah. photos and, and maps. Yeah. So he was more than happy to come this evening, and I told no. him this morning I didn't think it was necessary. No, I agree, but the next time it would be helpful. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of uh, sending this item to public hearing? 7-0. Thanks. Item number 141-2009. Um, Sarah, I'll look to you again. Uh, you are the council's representative on the town center pedestrian safety committee. Uh, would you like to report? Yes, we met twice, um, and by we, it, it was um, myself, Mary Townsend, who's a member of the school board, Cynthia Dill, and Tom Kinley, both are um, citizens. And our charge was to evaluate pedestrian issues in the town center, review progress, and to make additional recommendations. Um, do you want me to run through what has already been done, Mike? Would that be helpful? Very sure. briefly, um, I guess it's pretty obvious when you drive through town, but basically the pedestrian crosswalks have been painted to be much more prominent and that the, there was a commitment to paint them twice a year rather than once. One was added, I think, from Key Bank over to Jonesy's, so essentially there's pedestrian crosswalks now to get you around the whole intersection. Um, there are the state signs in the middle saying do not no, no driving while pedestrians in a crosswalk. They're those flags that let kids go over when they pick them up and it becomes more visible. Um, a, a crosswalk with a light was added down at the high school to get kids across 77. Um, what am I missing? Uh, number six. A signs were placed. Signs are placed at each of the crosswalks, the, the triangle signs with that show the picture of the person crossing and saying do not cross if someone's in a crosswalk. Um, and essentially, our committee considered various options, and the three ones that stood out to us the most that would be the most effective in um, further increasing pedestrian safety were um, the speed limit, um, the, the, the width of the shoulders worried us a lot, because essentially a car can now pull around. If a car stops for a child walking across, a car can pull around on the shoulder and then run the child over without realizing there's one in the crosswalk. So that was a big issue for us. And the third was just getting kids safely across the crosswalk when people don't see them coming. And we deliberated at length about all three of those. And essentially what we decided to do was to present to you tonight 
um, the first and sort of the most easily implemented and what we hope will make the biggest single difference, which is uh, a pedestrian actual light that runs across this main crosswalk um, sort of 20 feet before the intersection that connects, um, what does it go from and to? Caldwell Bank to Key Bank. Thank you. We want to put a pedestrian crosswalk in there that's um, solar that's solar powered and it's activated by somebody pushing a button and um, when you push the button it flashes so that the car sees that somebody's there and stops the car so on both sides so that the person can walk across the road and we there, it's going to be twenty thousand dollars so we thought the, the best place to put it was that most central place that gets people actually across the road um, and then there was some consensus on the committee that we didn't want to stop looking at the other two issues, but we wanted to implement them one at a time to see what the, what the effects was of the first one, which we would then maybe consider the second one. I think the most compelling next one for us was the narrowing down of shoulders, at least where people cross. And there's some ways to do that where you sort of um, put bumps in the road and you make it so cars can't pass. So I, I hope we're going to look at that next. Not us, because we've been disbanded, but us. And then thirdly, maybe down the road a little bit, we'll reconsider the speed limit. Thank you, sir. And uh, so we have a recommendation um, that the $21,000 for the uh, solar-powered uh, crosswalk light uh, be funded by, the, uh, by a portion of the 2008 municipal bond for the town center intersection. Uh, do I hear a motion to that effect? David? I would move that we allocate the $21,000 approximately from the town center improvements uh, portion of the 2008 municipal bond to fund the uh, installation of the uh, solar power uh, crosswalk signal. Crossing signals. Thank you. Uh, from town hall across to the Caldwell Bank uh, real estate office. Uh, it's not Key Bank to Caldwell Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, Second motion. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion? David? Should the uh, motion be expanded to approve the recommendations of the working group? Mm -hmm. There are a few other recommendations included that crosswalk painting be done uh, twice a year in the spring and the fall, um, that the uh, road stanchions be continued, which has a budget impact of $750. Um, and then finally, um, that the committee be discharged mm -hmm. from future responsibility. Would you like to offer that as a friendly amendment to the, to the motion? You may. Thank you. Would you accept that? Certainly. Okay. And the second? Yes. Was okay. So we have a, an expanded motion now, which will include uh, approval of all the recommendations from the Town Center Pedestrian Safety Committee, as well as the uh, allocation of $21,000 from the 2008 bond issue. Uh, further discussion on the motion? Uh, Ann? Uh, Mike? Yeah, I, looked like you wanted yeah, to. Councilor Swift Gatter had attended a couple of the meetings. She had questions about what, a, what do these bump outs look like that referred to where you narrow up the crosswalk. The, the best place you see those is by the Eastland Hotel between the Emanuel Baptist Church and the Eastland. Uh, when you drive, a lot of Cape people drive through there, you can see the way the, the, the sidewalk actually extends out so that the area that people need to cross is not as wide. There's another one up. Uh, between uh, I did set up the park where Dunkin' Donuts was once upon a time, yeah. uh, and over to the, the state building, uh, which just up from the Eastland, uh, across from the Art Museum. So you're talking about in front of the front door of the Eastland? In, right in front of the front door of the Eastland, you could see uh, one of them there. So I just wanted to mention that. The other thing is I really wanted to thank all, all the members of the committee and Chief Williams. Uh, it, was a, it was a very interesting committee to work with, and uh, I was really pleased to that, you know, I, I think they have a very sensible approach. Yeah. Um, I attended a, a number of the meetings, and um, I'll be supporting the motion. I think it's the approach that the committee took is an incremental approach, and uh, I think that's the right approach to sort of look and see what happens with this flashing crossing signal thing and then see what happens, and then if that's not working, to move on. And rather than throw a whole bunch of things at it at once, um, and then not know what was having what impact, and then we wouldn't be able to duplicate it in other areas, potentially, in the future. So, so I will be supporting the motion. 
Thanks, Sam. David? Yeah, I, I confess when I first read this, I thought, is that it? But uh, then I saw the logic of the committee's approach, and I agree with uh, what Ann has just said. I think we, it makes sense to implement these one at a time. Um, I, I'm still not convinced that speeding is a real issue in the town center intersection area anyway. I, I think what we've done so far has had a lot of positive effect on lowering uh, the speed of vehicles, so I will also support the motion. I think what the committee did makes a great deal of sense. So thanks to them. Thanks, David. Paul? I, I too support the committee's recommendations. And I, I just want to state that in my travels, um, I have seen both of those measures put into place, especially in Canada. They, it's a very common approach to do the bump out. And if you do that and do the, uh, the lights, very, very effective. I've seen very busy roads come to a screeching halt uh, for pedestrians crossing. The lights flash for a few seconds and long enough to cross the street and then they stop automatically. It's, it's not really intrusive. It doesn't stop traffic for any long period of time but it's much safer for pedestrians. So I'm very pleased with your results. Can you Thank take you a job. picture next time you're there? I can. I want to see the bump out with the light. I can. Okay. <laughs> there is one of those lights uh, not too far from my office as you're heading out Preble Street extension towards the Hannaford as you're approaching the back cove area. They have the uh, activated uh, lights for the crosswalk. And cars go whizzing along there and it does cause folks to slow down, if not always stop, but it does cause them to slow down. Just a quick question. Um, what was the rationale for the key bank, Caldwell Bank, uh, you know, Caldwell uh, Banker Real Estate Office location? Is there got the greatest number of people crossing at that? We had a lot of discussion about that. Um, Essentially, we decided that the most dangerous cross was across 77 rather than across Scott Dyer or Shore. So then it became where on 77 would we put it? I actually at first was in favor of putting it sort of between Cumbies and Jonesies because so many kids run across there every day. Right. But we decided that to sort of institutionally sanction that was problematic because it's not really a very good place to cross at all because the cars are going pretty fast up the hill and they're also coming through the intersection and sort of starting to to pick up speed again, and sometimes the sun in the late afternoon can be in people's eyes there. So all those things put together, we thought, was a bad place to, to corral people to be going across. So what we're trying to strongly do is get kids to stop running across there, to cross in the appropriate place where it's much safer, because the traffic is very much slowed between the intersection and the high school. Okay. To get them to cross there, and then they, they have to do a, a, a jag, a one, and then they have to go across the shore road one. Right. So we're really trying to discourage what they're actually doing. And we had some conversation about how to do that. And we thought maybe we should talk to some of the coaches okay. and even Steve Connolly in the middle school. That seems to be the kids who do it the most. Mm -hmm. um, to really try to read them the right act and encourage them to do it properly and go across the one that's going to help them and then over. Okay. okay. It was, it was, there was some deliberation behind that. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, 7-0. And thanks again to you, Sarah, and uh, Mary, and Cynthia, and Tom, for your work. Uh, item number 142-2009, uh, concession stand at Hannaford Field. Uh, the school board has approved the installation of a concession, concession stand at Hannaford Field to be privately funded. Uh, it's recommended the town council authorize an application to amend the approved site plan for the school grounds with all costs to be privately funded. We do have a representative here, uh, Alan Tebow, of the group as well. Okay. Helen, would you like to speak to that? Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Alan Tebow, and I'm a representative of the high school soccer boosters organization, but I'm here on behalf of all the outdoor um, organizations, sport, uh, youth and high school. Uh, we've come together and looked at the possibility of doing a formal concession shed at the Hannaford Field location and realized that the economy is not in a situation that would help support fundraising for it. So we took a step back and said in order to get our fundraising opportunities, again, we'd like to do a, a shed similar to what used to be on the upper field. If you remember up on the upper track field, there was one before Hannaford Field was developed, and we'd like to get a small shed, 
put in place that could eventually get relocated and used for storage or for concessions or whatever else somewhere else in the in the community and we would like to uh, just build a small garden shed we wouldn't have any utilities connected to it uh, would bring everything in take everything out we'd maintain it we have support of all the uh, soccer uh, lacrosse the football boosters have either offered uh, financial contributions or in-kind contributions of labor materials or equipment to support this it would be shared by all the groups um, and we've worked with the athletic director to try to coordinate that and we would develop a set of rules and regulations similar to Little League where the, the team that comes in to use is it responsible for opening and closing and securing and making sure that it's maintained in a proper fashion and then if it isn't it'd be a reporting responsibility back up through the athletic director with the chain of command back down to try to get things corrected if they went awry. So we're hoping that you would uh, see the uh, benefits to that and our efforts to raise funds to support these children uh, in their athletic adventures. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'd be happy. Any questions of Alan? Yeah, Sarah? Can you just say where the bleachers are on this picture? I yes. The, the drawing that you have in front of you was developed before the bleachers were installed. And at the bottom of the field, right there, uh, directly above that black line, I actually drew in a line uh, where the fence has been relocated to. So it would, be re it would be located, if you're looking at the bleachers as you're driving down the hill, there's a vehicle access on the right side of where the Porta Johns are. Uh, the Porta Johns are to the right. This would be directly to the left of that, and it'd be away from the bleachers, um, so it wouldn't cause any confusion for people. Other questions of Alan? Yes. Any? It, how long is temporary? I don't have an answer for that. Uh, our goal would eventually to be to build a full facility, but that's going to take um, a lot of planning. It will take a lot of permitting activities, uh, design considerations. Um, you know, I would like to think we could do something within five years that would be considered permanent, but until we can get an effort raised um, and, and mobilized and people coming forward to support that, uh, I don't know. I, my guess it would be maybe five years or so before a permanent facility would be in place. We have more questions. Yes. How, how are we... I mean, I know that you're really committed to ensuring that the building stays looking uh, nice. Um, how are we going to ensure that? We, we have um, indicated, with, uh, we've worked with Jeff Thorak, and we have um, discussed as a collective group that we would generate a formal list of things that were be required to keep it um, in, in uh, a condition that would be acceptable. And that could be the cleanliness, the policing of the grounds around it, making sure the trash is picked up, the tables and the grills are put away, and all the other amenities were taken care of. Um, and we would do it, and if it wasn't, it would get reported back to Jeff, and then he would have a, a list of representatives from each booster organization, be it the treasurer, the secretary, or whoever was assigned and responsible for it, that he could go back to and say, okay, it was left in such a condition, we need you to come back and either clean it up or to do what is required to, to keep it satisfied. Okay. Anne? Um, so who would actually own this shed? Would this be the property of the town? Ultimately anything on the property. We would own it, insure it. The estimated insurance cost is $12 per year. Okay. So it's, there's no, um, all costs are going to be privately funded, but it will be the property of the town. And then yeah, and you know, we would, they would be responsible for the inside. We would be responsible for the outside of it once it was built, just as we are the outside of any okay. of our other facilities. I, I was just trying to address some of Penny's concerns. I hadn't really thought about that, so I'm glad you brought up the question about if it did fall into disrepair, and I'm sure it won't. But would the town be able to do anything about it? So yeah, it's, it, it sounds. It's no problem for us to, to make minor repairs if, to the okay. outside. Anything. We don't want to get involved in the inside, though, because you make one little change with all those different groups, and we don't want to get involved in it. And, and we would be willing to maintain the outside as well and work with the town on that and painting and, and doing what we needed to do to keep it upright. I mean, we want that facility to look like it should. We don't want it to fall into disrepair. And that's not our goal. Our goal is to benefit the community, not to detract from it. And it would be, it, we're not going to go out to Home Depot and buy the cheapest shed we can get. We're going to have this stick built on site 
So it'll be quality construction. It'll be 16 inch on center with the studs. It won't be 24 inches. You won't have two nails holding the roof choice. Uh, this will be done by a professional builder. Right, and I, I'm, I have the utmost in confidence in the booster groups that they'll you know, do the right thing and take care of it, but sometimes stuff happens, mm -hmm. like happened to the previous shed, and right. then I just wanted to make sure I knew who had the authority to do something to the shed if it, through no fault of the boosters, became a problem. Mm -hmm. But I, my fears are allayed. So, no problem. Thanks, Ann. We'll work uh, cooperatively. Sir? I just wanted to thank you guys for all that you do. It's amazing how much money the boosters raise, and I know it's by dint of hard work from all parents. Well, on and behalf of all the people and yourselves, I'm sure, support a lot of the activities that we have. We thank everybody that contributes. It makes a big difference in these students' lives. Huge difference. Other questions of Alan? Comments? Real brief one that, that doesn't directly relate. I just wanted to update the council. I did have a meeting with Alan Hawkins and Jeff Thorick, Jeff Shedd this week, uh, uh, a couple of the municipal department heads as well. There needs to be a focus on what booster clubs are responsible for doing and what the high school athletic department is responsible for doing. Uh, there's been issues this year with the rescue and whether or not the rescue ought to be there. There's issues on the number of police officers that ought to be there. There's issues on who pays for portable toilets. And the school department's been taking the position that anything new or different now has to be funded by the booster groups. You know, it, it's put us in a very awkward position that the police officers, for example, are made to feel very uncomfortable at some of these events and getting, you know, comments made to them, you know, from the booster group, we're needing, we're having to pay to have you here. Uh, you know, I, I, I just want to say it's time for a rethinking of really what is a booster, what a booster club is responsible for, a booster group, and what generally ought to be footed as part of the overall program of providing a particular sport. I know everyone wants to say that these sports don't cost us money or that, that you know, that the private sector ought to fund things, but there are basic particularly public safety pieces, that you shouldn't be in the position in the end of the booster group deciding how many police officers you have at a, at a scene or whether or not a rescue is. So I just wanted to update the council that I've, I've engaged in that dialogue. It might not be, I may not have the most popular position, particularly with the school budget, you know, challenged as it is, but, you know, it, it just, in my view, is not right to suddenly tell parents, by the way, you need to pay for toilets, you know, at, at a high school field. Uh, you need to pay for, uh, you know, if, if we think we need three police officers for the Mountain Valley game, you know, th that ought to be a burden that's bared by the general citizenry if we believe we offer the sport, in my view, and not, you know, get into a debate every time with the booster group, how many of you are going to pay for it? It just is not a sensible way of doing things. So I just wanted to update you, and people can agree or disagree with my position, but I, I think it definitely needs a dialogue and a committee, and I've, I've really encouraged the superintendent to come up with a policy uh, so that we're not ad hocing this for every, every game and every sporting event. So in case you hear any flack about that, I thought it was a good chance to, to mention it. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Other questions of Alan while, he, while he's at the lectern? Thank you, Alan. You're welcome. I would now uh, entertain a motion. Ann? I'd like to move that we authorize an application to amend the approved site plan for the school grounds with all costs to be privately funded for the shed. Second. Moved and seconded. A discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item number 143-2009, uh, conservation land near the Leighton Farm subdivision. A citizen is asking the town council to change a decision by the town manager regarding the use of municipal property near 8 Leighton Farms Road. Uh, the same citizen this past week has asked that this item be uh, deferred until our November meeting. So I would uh, offer a motion that we uh, table discussion on item number 143-2009 uh, until our November 9 meeting. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your tabling motion that someone, who had asked for this to the, be? The deferred? same citizen that requested that this item be considered tonight has asked that it be deferred until November. Is there a reason? Uh, he has further organization to do in his case, I, apparently. 
He indicated he wanted to speak to legal counsel. I, I, I'll, I'll not add any commentary about the merits of his application, but I'll move to table this at his request till the November meeting to allow him an opportunity to prepare. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, and it's a tabling motion, so there's no discussion. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. That was tabled to the November meeting. November 9 okay. meeting. I just want to be clear because it's an issue I don't think should stay in limbo too long. It's an issue that what? Should not stay in limbo for too long. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, it should I be could, resolved one way or the other. Just could we make it clear that at least I would not be inclined to table it again. Uh, that it ought to be resolved. So hopefully Mr. O'Hearn will be ready at the November meeting. I believe he will be. Okay. Thank you. Uh, item number 144-2009. Uh, I'll do a little setup on this. Um, we had a, a workshop on September 3rd, a town council workshop. Uh, we met with the Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee. Um, we had a tour of the Thomas Memorial Li Library facility as it is today. And we heard the, a very compelling argument about why changes needed to be made at the library. Um, the uh, Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee's report uh, recommended essentially a rebuild of the, of the entire library, and that was the, uh, the ultimate recommendation from that committee. Um, but the end of that uh, workshop was rather inconclusive regarding next steps. And so uh, on September 15th, um, Ann, Mike, and I met with uh, Thomas Memorial Library Director Jay Sharma and also uh, chair, Chairwoman of the Committee, uh, Nancy Marshall, to uh, just kick around some possible next steps uh, with regard to the Thomas Memorial Library. Um, we had no decision-making authority. We just uh, put some ideas forward. I felt it was a very productive and candid meeting. And at the end of the meeting, uh, I will go down through some of the suggestions that uh, we came up with. It was suggested that the Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee be formally thanked by the Town Council and relieved of its duty uh, at our next Town Council meeting, which is tonight. Uh, the Thomas Memorial Library trustees would uh, again become the primary contact group as discussions about the library's future proceed. Uh, it was felt that due to the impending significant change in the makeup of the town council um, that further consideration by the council should probably be delayed until the seating of the new council uh, to provide a little more stability to this decision-making process. Um, with that said, it was also felt that we should give the new council time to get their feet on the ground and uh, to have some orientation not only with regard to their, their new positions but new counselors, but uh, also with regard to the library issue, and it suggested that we hold another workshop uh, on the library at the end of the first quarter of the, the new council year. Um, it was also suggested that a program of public education be embarked upon to generate interest in the proposed changes uh, in the community. Uh, we obviously, the, the, the needs have been well expressed by the committee, but uh, I think it was felt by the people that met on the 15th that uh, by and large the, the citizenry uh, is not crying out for a new library right now. Uh, I don't think the need is, is, is widely understood in the community. So we felt that there should be some uh, effort put into to, uh, educating our citizens uh, on the state of the library. Um, it was also suggested that uh, as part of the education process, counselors and interested citizens might also uh, gain from a presentation on capital campaigns and or uh, nonprofit fundraising. These types of introductory programs are typically offered uh, pro bono by, by professional fundraisers. And it's a great opportunity to learn about uh, fundraising outside of uh, tax dollar fundraising. And also, finally, the uh, Thomas Memorial Library Foundation, which is separate from the trustees, should be contacted in order to discern how they feel uh, regarding the, the study committee's recommendations. So uh, 
those are the, those are the suggestions. Uh, I don't know if we need to formally act on them tonight, but I just wanted to update citizens on uh, where discussions were. Uh, I would, however, like to entertain a motion uh, to publicly thank uh, the Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee for their hard work. Uh, it's been a, a long process uh, to date, uh, approximately two years. It's been a very transparent process. There have been a number of uh, opportunities for the public to weigh in on the, the uh, Thomas Memorial Library, uh, forums, uh, charrettes, uh, discussions with the consultants, uh, Himmel and Wilson, and also Casaccio uh, Architects. Um, I, I think the committee has done a great job in, uh, in including as many people in the community as they can uh, to arrive at the uh, recommendations that they have arrived at. So I would entertain a motion, uh, Ann. Um, first of all, I'd just like to comment that I was a member of the committee, and it was a, a long and um, laborious, not in an arduous sense, but it, there was a lot of work involved in the process, and it was a really good group of people. And I think that uh, they, given the, their charge, the committee came up with um, some good recommendations now as to whether they will be implemented, time will tell, but I do want to thank them for all their hard work. So I move that we thank the Thomas Memorial Library, Library Study Committee um, for their work and acknowledge that they will now be disbanding and that from here on forward we have the Thomas Memorial Library trustees assume planning responsibilities for the library and the library building. That's the motion. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. Moved and second. A discussion on the motion? I think I said what I would have said now a few minutes ago. Other, other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? Unanimous. Thank you, Ann, and thanks again to the committee for their great work. It's much appreciated. Uh, item number 145-2009, uh, Councillor uh, Swift-Cayato would like to set up uh, a proposed resolution for the Town Council to consider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the first of these next two items has to do, they both have to do with questions that are on the statewide ballot in November, only a few weeks away. The first one, this item number 145, has to do with a proposal um, which seeks to amend the automobile excise tax. And I have circulated to the council, and it's also been online, uh, a resolution uh, which would indicate the town council's opposition to that ballot question. And if I might, I'd just like to go through a few of the reasons why, or I can wait for a second, and then if you could return to me. I'll second the motion. Okay, thank you. Um, just to share with the public uh, why I'm putting this forward, uh, this proposal, this question that appears on the ballot, uh, if it is approved, would result in, in a dramatic reduction of the automobile excise tax. And many people don't realize that those excise tax dollars, which um, are gathered in the town of Cape Elizabeth when you... Uh, register and re-register your car, those dollars stay locally. They don't go to the state. They stay in our community locally, and they are used uh, to a great degree to support road maintenance and uh, road projects in our community, including plowing in the winter. Um, so if this were to pass, uh, it would have a significant impact on our roads budget and public works budget. Uh, a few facts about the ballot question. Vehicles, the way it's written, uh, it would change the, the rates of excise tax charged to newer cars, but vehicles, um, even though vehicles of less than six years old would see a reduction in the excise tax, vehicles six years old or older would see no change. So anybody who has a car six years old or older would see no change in their excise tax. 68% of vehicles statewide are six years old or older, and they would see no change in their excise tax. Passage of this referendum, I, I consulted with the town manager to 
so we could sort of estimate what the numbers would mean specifically for our community. It would result, if passed, it would result in approximately 45 percent reduction in auto excise tax revenue received by our town here in Cape Elizabeth. That is the third largest revenue source supporting the town general fund uh, and town general operations. It provides the town with approximately $1.7 million annually, an amount that would be reduced by $758,000 under this proposal. Um, that money, as I said before, is used to maintain our roads. And if that $758,000 goes away, that's a tremendous hit to the municipal budget. That would have significant negative impacts in that, on our community in that either we would have to stop maintaining our roads and stop plowing as much as we do. and We'd have to give up a lot. And I'm sure it would roll over, impacts would roll over onto um, the schools and other operations in the town. Um, or we would have to raise property taxes to replace that uh, lost revenue. This is, other than property taxes, this is one of the biggest revenues that we get. And um, if we had to increase the property tax rate to make up this money, it would be a 57 cent increase, estimated, um, per thousand of assessed value. That's a huge increase. So given that we've already made on the municipal side cuts in dispatching, in streetlights, in heavy item pickup, and other staff positions from last year's budget in order to maintain a stable tax rate, a reduction of that magnitude would require the elimination of additional municipal and school services and staff. So therefore, I would like to propose that the council signs this resolve that we urge citizens to study very carefully the information on this ballot issue and to consider the serious consequences of potential reduced road maintenance, plowing, and other municipal services and, this, and or the significant impact of property tax increases, both of which could be necessitated by passage of this ballot issue. We hope that citizens will join us in voting no on the excise tax proposal, which is question number two on the state referendum ballot for November 2009. And I would add that I have worked with Rebecca Millette, school board member Rebecca Millette, um, on the wording of this and the next item, and uh, the school board passed uh, similar wording last night, urging uh, this thing that the school board urges a vote no on this question number two. So that's, that's why I'm proposing this, and I would move the resolution. Oh, I'm sorry, already moved the okay, resolution. Or seconded it. I would move it again. <laughs> so. I'll second it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, discussion on the motion to create, a, a, in essence, a joint resolution with the school board mm -hmm. uh, to oppose the proposed excise tax adjustments. David. Um, I'd like to um, propose um, one addition to uh, the motion, to the proposed resolution. And my comments go to not only this one, but the following resolution on our agenda as well that deals with so-called Tabor II. Um, and what I'd like to suggest, both of these items, the, the um, amending the excise tax as well as imposing restrictions on elected officials' ability to increase taxes without voter approval um, are reactionary, um, as was the original Tabor when it uh, was first put on the ballot a few years ago. And it's reactionary in reaction to voters' perception, at least, that elected officials are um, seemingly oblivious to the requests of voters who want their elected officials to exercise restraint in spending and restraint in increasing taxes. And if voters didn't have that sense of frustration of oblivion from their elected officials, these things wouldn't even be on the ballot in November. Um, and my sense is that if we're going to ask voters to reject some kind of external restraint on 
our own ability to increase taxes or if we're going to ask voters to reject a cut in the excise tax, we have to give them something in return. Um, it's not enough merely to ask voters to reject these without recognizing that what we're really asking them to do is enter into a partnership with us. Um, we're asking them to, in essence, trust us, and we're asking them to trust us to be able to make decisions that are acceptable and in the overall public best interest. The public doesn't have that sense right now, or they wouldn't, these things wouldn't be on the ballot. It's really out of frustration um, and a lack of trust. And I'm not asking and I'm not proposing a revisiting of the 2005 pledge. I wouldn't go there. <laughs> um, my proposed language is much softer than that, but it's intended to be merely a public recognition that we are urging elected officials to exercise and to recognize that they have a responsibility to the public um, to restrain spending growth and tax increases to demonstrate that these kinds of external restraints are not necessary uh, to achieve the public's goal of, um, of making sure that public needs are met, but they're met in a fiscally responsible way. So that's a long way of an introduction, but my specific proposed language is that we add a sentence, just one sentence to each of these, that says the town council further urges all elected officials to exercise responsibility for reasonable restraints of spending growth and tax increases to demonstrate that citizen-imposed external restraints are not necessary for controlling spending and tax increases. So you're offering that as a friendly amendment to the, I am to the motion? I am offering that as a uh, amendment. I would accept that as a friendly amendment. And it's fine with the second as well. So we have an expanded motion, which includes David's uh, language, uh, discussion on that motion. Paul? I'd like to make a comment uh, with reference to these initiatives. If these initiatives are because people are frustrated and they think we're not listening, um, I would say, at least in terms of this council, they're wrong. For the, over the past five years, we have been very careful in our spending, and, and I don't, I, I can't speak prior to that because I was on the council, but I know for the past five years, we have restrained tax increases, and our average tax increase over the past five years has been 2.5 percent per year. I think that's very, very reasonable. And uh, we have been very careful with the budget. We've cut items and we have um, streamlined. And yet, at the same time, we've spent money wisely, I would say, I would suggest. And we have improved the community. We've improved the infrastructure. And those improvements will last a, a long time. And at the same time, we've provided adequate funding for the schools to maintain high quality infrastructure and high quality educational programs. So with that, I just want people to know we have been very, very careful in this community. And I would say in the region, based on my experience at the Greater Portland Council of Governments, we ha this region has been very careful. So the perception, although it, it is accurate that people perceive government out of control, is inaccurate, at least with respect to this region. I think there's been a lot more restraint than people realize, and I just want to make sure that they understand that when they go to the ballot. Thanks, Paul. Sarah, do you want to speak? Um, I was just going to suggest, actually, in light of what you both just said, that maybe the language could say, I forget the exact wording, but that Cape Elizabeth Town Council encourages continued restraint, or however it's worded. Because the implication there is that we haven't been, and I actually agree with Paul that we've been pretty disciplined. And, and just of note, this is a, this is a statewide initiative. Um, and in general, I think Cape Elizabeth, which Cape Elizabeth has always voted to defeat Tabor, Pulaski. So I feel like there's a, maybe perhaps a slight bit more contentment in our town itself than in the greater state, I hope. Um, 
but just as a nod to not only the work of past councils and this council, but the future council, since it's going to be so many new members, we wouldn't want to kind of speak for them. Maybe we should just, in a nod toward, toward that people have been trying, we should say that the town council and Kircher's continued restraint. <laughs> my suggestion. Would you like to offer that as a... Can I amend an amendment? amendment? Sure. Okay. If it's accepted. Yeah, I don't... Um, I, I have no opposition to that. And again, as I indicated when I first circulated this um, to the council, I'm not wedded to the wording at all. And I agree with Councilor McKinney that this council in the last five years has exercised admirable restraint in spending um, and in tax increases. Um, and I think that if statewide um, all elected officials had followed our lead, this might not be on the ballot, but it is. And um, I'm, I accept uh, the addition of the word continued restraint um, as proposed by Councilor Lina. It's okay with a second, too. Or I guess it was, um, the specific is um, to exercise continued responsibility for reasonable restraints of spending growth and tax increases. Continuing. 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 Uh, <laughs> we're going to wordsmith here. This is always hard when we wordsmith. How about urges all elected officials to continue to exercise responsibility? Does the same. Fine with me. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. So I'll, I'll accept it up the chain as <laughs> to the original amendment as a friendly amendment. And I'll read that last paragraph when we're done discussing just to make sure we all know what we're working. Okay. Uh, further discussion on the motion as amended as amended. <laughs> okay. Uh, could we have a rereading of the motion, okay. please? Um, it is as it was said, uh, sent to you in your packet, except, um, and then there was David's version was on the table in front of you, but that last paragraph will now say, the town council further urges all elected officials to continue to re exercise responsibility for reasonable restraints of spending growth and tax increases to demonstrate that citizen-imposed external restraints are not necessary for controlling spending and tax increases. Okay, we have the motion. It's been seconded. We've had our discussion. Is there any further discussion? One more time. Seeing none, all in favor of the motion. Uh, unanimous. Thank you. And perhaps before we all leave today, I don't know if it would be possible to get this, these extra two words yeah, I'd, I'd thrown in. Go stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That way we could sign it. I'll do the other one too. Okay. It, just assuming that the other language might happen to be the same on the second one. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Okay, moving on. Uh, item number 146-2009. Uh, this is the Tabor 2 ballot question. Uh, Ann is also sponsoring a proposed resolution uh, by the Town Council on that as well. So, Ann. Thanks, you, Jim. Um, I won't go into dreadful detail on this, but this is a similar resolve which would indicate, and also the school board passed something similar to this. It indicates the opposition of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council to the ballot question which seeks to modify current state law on tax and expenditure limitations on state and local government. What that is is Tabor II. Um, and basically the reasons are that since 2005 LD1 has been in operation and it actually has been inhibiting the growth of spending and of property tax changes. Um, it has been, I, I understand that many people don't feel it's been successful enough, but it has been limiting um, the increase in taxes. Uh, this Tabor II um, would apply to state governments and municipal governments, not to school departments, school governments, um, that are RSUs because already the public votes on those. So it's been modified since Tabor 1 came along. But in it, it would, in short, impose growth limits on state spending and on local 
municipal spending. Um, it applies not just to the state's general fund, but all funds of the state. And since, and people would say, so what's the, that got to do with us? Well, the state is the one that provides state aid for education. And so whatever happens at the state level, and, and also provides um, our uh, revenue sharing money on the municipal side. So whatever happens at the state level rolls downhill onto municipal government. So that's why we should be concerned about this. Also, this Tabor II proposal would establish fiscal year 2010 as the based year. There's a ratchet effect so that it would, 2010 is when a lot of government entities shrank. As we all know, the municipal government in Cape Elizabeth shrank in actual dollar spending. And it would set the baseline at that low level, and it would inhibit the recovery when the economy starts to recover. It would inhibit returning to a more normal level of, of spending. Um, the thing that really drives me nuts about this is that if the town or at the state level, um, the, the, but the uh, level of funding wanted to be exceeded beyond this very minimal level, at the state level there would have to be a statewide citizen vote any time the budget were to be exceeded. Um, and the cost of that is hundreds of thousands of dollars because there are requirements in, in Tabor II that you have to send a mailing to every registered voter in the state. So you would have to, I mean, it would just, it's supposed to save money, but it would cost a tremendous amount of money. And um, the same thing would happen in the town. The council could vote on the municipal government and then would have to send it, send it out for uh, a vote, but it would have to send a letter to everybody in town who's a registered voter. And heaven forbid that we had to vote more than once. It just would cost a ton of money. So um, this referendum voting, referendum voting thing seems crazy to me. So it would limit the flexibility of state and local, local governments to react to changing conditions and a, hopefully to a, an economic recovery. We wouldn't be able to respond to community needs or desires without going through a ton of expensive rigmarole. Um, and it would undermine the authority of elected officials to make budget and service decisions based on information and a depth of analysis, which is unlikely to be undertaken by the average voter. It's a very simplistic thumbs up, thumbs down um, way of voting on very complex subjects. And I just think it would be disastrous for our community and disastrous for the state. And therefore, uh, the resolution says, like on the last one, that we oppose the so-called Tabor II question. Um, we urge to people to become informed on it. Um, and that the, the resolution will be online and it has a lot more information. But uh, I would add also um, w that the town council members who are signing below hope the citizens will join us in voting no on Tabor II, which is question number four. And um, adding David's language, the town council would further urge all elected officials to continue to exercise responsibility for reasonable restraints of spending growth and tax increases to demonstrate that citizen-imposed external restraints are not necessary for controlling spending and tax increases. So my motion is to approve this resolution. Okay. Is the motion? Do I hear a second? Second. Seconded by Penny. Uh, discussion on this motion? Paul? A couple of uh, items come to mind. Uh, one is, uh, Ann stated it quite well, but I'm going to restate it a little bit differently. Uh, first of all, I think many of the people supporting Tabor II are well intentioned. Mm -hmm. I think that they feel that spending is out of control and this is a way to restrain spending. So I, I think their intentions are good. What I also believe is that they don't really understand how, particularly how municipal government works. Um, it, on, on the face of it, it seems like if you set spending at a certain limit, let's say it's inflation, 3% um, per year, what's wrong with that? It, that seems reasonable, right? Uh, on its face, it seems reasonable. The problem is that 
the circumstances change on a continual basis. And, and when you're around municipal government for a while, you realize that sometimes, some years, you have more revenue than you, the, and, and your spending needs are less. And other years, you might have less revenue and your spending needs increase because you have needs that you must meet. They might be emergency needs, they might be maintenance needs, they might be, for, for example, we had a, a situation a few years ago where we had a problem with the sewer system and people had backups in their, in their basements and we needed to do something rather quickly to replace some of the infrastructure so that those problems would go away. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a big storm in April, if, as you may recall, and we had lots of trees blown down, and we had to do something immediately to take care of those storm issues, and that cost us a lot of extra money. And, and there are many, many examples, but my point is that sometimes you have to change your, your methods to get to your goal. And I think we increased um, municipal spending, was it last year or the year before, Michael, 10.4% or something? In that? Two years ago. Two years ago. Now, that's very unusual, but it was necessary that year. It wasn't spending, it was taxes. It was taxes, excuse spending me. Spending was up 3%. Okay, spending was up 3%, but my point is it changes from year to year based on different needs and different revenue. Um, if people are building lots of houses and we're getting lots of new permits, we're going to get more money in. If housing starts uh, don't come through like they have in the last couple of years, all of a sudden that money dries up and you, it's not predictable. So you have to have flexibility. And the people that support Tabor 2 need to understand that if you constrain spending and put, it, put a limit on it like they're suggesting, you really restrain your government from doing the things it needs to do to be effective. And that's why I oppose it. It's not a good solution. A good solution is to become informed, to vote, choose your elected representatives, and trust them to learn about the issues and vote the appropriate way. Mike, you had a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to fill in a couple more of those numbers so we don't leave it hanging of Thank you. what the taxes were two years ago. Over the last, over the last two years, including that year and the current year, we're at flat level spending compared to where we were three years ago. So we went up and then we went back down. So I just, I, I don't want it left that, you know, we had this big increase and we, we haven't dealt with the times. Uh, right. In fact, the municipal budget is, is essentially at the same level it was three years ago. Yeah, my point is, it, things change and you need flexibility. And without the flexibility, you're not going to have a very effective government. Thanks, Paul. Uh, further comment, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion. Unanimous, 7-0, thanks. Item number 147-2009, uh, it's proposed to approve the warrant for the November 3rd election. If we don't approve it, I understand we won't have an election, so <laughs> so I'd entertain a motion. <laughs> I move we approve the warrant for the November 3rd election. There's the motion. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor. 7-0. Thanks. Item number 148-2009. Uh, town staff is asking the town council to adopt a pro forma resolution in order to permit the town to make deposits at Gorham Savings Bank. Gorham Savings Bank was the high bidder at three quarters of one percent uh, interest on the short term investment of proceeds from the recent bond refinancing. Mike, do you have a comment on this? Yeah, this is a uh, this is actually in a money market fund. I think I said a CD in, the, in an email I sent to you when I asked this to be added to the, the agenda. It's in a money market fund. We actually received four different bids. Citizens Bank also gave us a bid. I didn't include them in the earlier email when I had a chance to actually review all the details with Pauline on this this afternoon. But it was it, their bid of uh, Gorham Savings Bank of 0.75 was 50 percent higher than the next nearest bid. Uh, and the, the monies, you know, the monies that are at hand now are only going to be invested for about a month, but at the same time, we can earn 50% more during the, a given month than, than we otherwise uh, would be able to, uh, we wish to do that. And all the monies are fully collateralized. 
Uh, we don't need to worry about them giving us this exorbitant 0.75 uh, <laughs> percent rate. <laughs> that is, Gorham Savings Bank's good, strong bank. So I'd entertain a motion to adopt a pro forma resolution as put forward in this item in our, in our packets. So moved. Moved Second. and seconded. Discussion on the motion? Ann? Um, I just wanted to ask Mike, how, how much money was it that we were saving um, by uh, on the, the bond re... Uh, Almost three quarters of a million dollars. Yes. I didn't bring all the material with me, but it was between the school budget and the municipal budget, it was over half a million dollars. Okay. I, that we, I had that thought we're it, saving I, over the course of the uh, next uh, eight years as a result of the bond refinance. Okay. So it's a very significant yeah. uh, amount of money, and I just wanted to once again thank you, Michael, and um, our financial advisor, Joe yeah. Quitara for your work on this because this is something that without your work on it we wouldn't it wouldn't have really become apparent at least to me and um, we're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars due to your work and I just want to for both the schools and the municipal budget so just if I might to put you. this in perspective th this is the these are the monies that were borrowed for the Donald Richards pool that was approved by the voters uh, back in uh, quite a few years ago for, uh, for the monies that are still left for the 1994 renovation of the middle school and uh, the elementary school, as well as for the construction of the uh, public works garage uh, and the purchase of the Gulf Coast property. And the interest that we're now paying for the remainder of those bonds is one third of what it was before the refinancing. We've, we've, we've dropped our interest expense by two thirds out of the remaining life of those bonds. And, you know, it just the uh, it really shows you know what a favorable environment there was for, for refinancing the the uh, true interest cost if I recall is that would be this money is now being borrowed on is 1.68 percent uh, which is un, unheard of uh, Joe Katara who works for Moore's and Cabin in Boston our financial advisor uh, said that he had never seen a rate that low for uh, for you know monies that were being borrowed for more than just a year or two well, at, at the risk of embarrassing our town manager, I had a, a rather lengthy conversation up at uh, the Maine Municipal Association con Convention with Joe Katara, and he was singing the praises of our town manager and saying how much money Michael, due to Michael's work, that we had saved for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. So I just wanted to make that noted, and thank you. Well, I just wanted to, to echo Ann's comment. I, I didn't talk to Joe, but I, I was very impressed with uh, the savings. And I just want to say that this particular um, item, it seems small, but it's not small. And it demonstrates what Michael does day in and day out, along with you know working with the council to save the citizens money and to do the right thing with the citizens money so that we get they get the best return on their dollar, whether it be a project in town or money that needs to be used for something else in the future. He handles it quite well. So, Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Paul. Other comments? Uh, okay. So we look forward to doing business with Gorham Savings Bank. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All in favor of the motion. 7-0. Thanks. We offer our second opportunity for citizens to speak to items that are not on tonight's agenda. Would either of our media correspondents wish to speak to an item not on the agenda? No, I'm here seeing shake. So before we adjourn, I would just like to uh, review the upcoming meetings of the council. Uh, actually, uh, tomorrow afternoon, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have a uh, horticulture walk at Fort Williams Park beginning at 2 o'clock at the uh, picnic shelter. Tomorrow evening we have a town council workshop and finance committee meeting at 7.30 p.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. This will be primarily to re review the auditor's report. Uh, we obviously have the uh, election coming up on November 3rd uh, and I would not, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, a, a word of thanks to all the candidates that have come forward. We have uh, full slates of candidates for both the town council and uh, school board this year and it's great to see that kind of that level of public involvement uh, in the election process. 
Prior to the election, however, there will be a candidate's night for school board members, uh, pr prospective school board members on October 19th, and uh, for pr prospective town councilors on October 21st, both right here at the, in the council chambers from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock on both nights. The next regular town council meeting is Monday, November 9th, and the workshop for November is Thursday, uh, November 12th. Uh, with that said, uh, I would uh, entertain a comment from the manager. It's really quick. I just wanted to mention, I believe this is probably Taryn's last night in the cable booth. Uh, she's been helping us out for a couple of years, and she's waving goodbye now. She's going to be relocating out of state. So uh, we're going to very much miss her services and uh, she's done a great job uh, while she's been with us. And if anyone is interested in uh, assisting us in our cable operations, uh, please uh, send us an email, and we're, we're entertaining applications at this point. We also have a police officer vacancy, Chris Burgess, uh, who's been with us for a couple of years, is, is relocating to the Westbrook uh, Police Department. More opportunities for advancement uh, primarily is the reason. and. Uh, we're going to miss him, and there'll be an ad in the newspaper for a new police officer, uh, I believe, in the next, on Monday. So, uh, thank you. Thanks for those updates, Mike. Uh, entertaining a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Jim. Sure. So, we request Pete for tomorrow's date.